Hi. Um, so <clears throat> when Krish uh, actually uh, asked me to, to do this talk, um, originally he and I were talking about different things that, uh, that we might go into and, and what I should talk about with regards to data gravity. Um, and one thing that struck me that, that Chris said was that he wanted me to, uh, to tie data gravity to something that people could take away uh, today and, and use. So they could walk out and actually apply this versus it being uh, uh, purely theoretical from the sense of just an idea. Um, and so hopefully uh, you'll be able to take some things away from this uh, that you can use uh, and, and apply. And I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping that at the end you, you think. Uh, that's really what my end goal of, of this presentation is. So to get started, um, data gravity uh, starts out with data. Uh, and with data, you have applications and services. This becomes an interesting uh, and complex uh, web that gets woven over time. Uh, you have the relationship of, if you just have a lump of data uh, sitting there um, without an application or something else to access it, you, you don't really have very much. It's not useful to anyone or anything. You have to be able to communicate uh, and extract and ultimately leverage that data. So you have applications and services, and I'm going to draw out the, the differences between the two uh, as we move forward. So one of the effects uh, of data gravity uh, is that it attracts applications and services. The reason for this attraction is the distance over a network uh, between the application and the data. The, the existence of this is, uh, is based on uh, distance and latency uh, and bandwidth are what really make up the virtual distance between them. So uh, what I mean by that is less distance between the apps or services and the data means that you most likely will have lower latency and or you'll have higher bandwidth. So you're advantaged by being closer to the data. So in reality, applications and services end up being logic and the association between the two ends up being uh, that an application uh, is more of the logic layer, and a service is simply an interface on top of something that's the equivalent of that logic layer. Uh, users interface with applications, and machines interface with services, uh, at least if we're talking about SOA-style services. I'm not talking about uh, SaaS. SaaS still has an application with an interface on it. So to draw that out, you have a UI attached to the application, and you have an API, which is really what makes it a service. This is a very simplistic way of looking at things, but uh, an easy way to, to mentally grasp what, what data gravity is really all about. So if you look at this diagram, you'll see that uh, you have the user using the UI to the application, the machine leveraging an API uh, via the service, and they're all ultimately trying to access the data. Uh, but less distance between these things generally is going to mean more responsive experience. So all in all, you have this attractive effect where you have data um, with applications and services attaching to the data. Well, over time, if things work correctly, you end up with more applications trying to access that data set as well as more services. This happens and has happened in the cloud uh, quite a bit. Uh, if you think about uh, many of the problems in, uh, in Amazon East, and if you think about uh, different services layered on top of one another, uh, you end up with a data set that more and more people want access to, and they want access to that data set in different formats and ways, and that's usually done through the addition of services and applications. And so you end up with this multiplicative effect that happens over time, where you have more and more services accessing this data, uh, what becomes even more interesting is that uh, it gets complicated and you end up with stress points where you have uh, very high amounts of usage by particular services or applications. Uh, this becomes a complex system over time. It gets more and more complex and you end up with things like supernodes um, and these, these supernodes end up having to take on a life of their own. Uh, if these things move, uh, move to less and less standardization, uh, the difficulty in maintaining them goes up. 
And you also have more of uh, an effect of other data sources popping up. So now you want, now the second social media site pops up and it has uh, all sorts of new things that people want. Uh, and eventually you end up with the desire to connect them. Uh, it's interesting because if you notice in the, uh, in the top right, the data with the service uh, attached to it, not via network connection, you can think of this as something along the lines of a classic relational database or something like that where we choose to house uh, the service and the data in the same place. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's not a network between them. It just means the location of the network is much closer. Uh, so you can think on, a, on an actual physical system, you still have a network even on one physical computer. It's a bus, right? We have a PCI bus, we have Northbridge, Southbridge. All of these things are still networks. They're just very low latency, very high bandwidth, but they're still networks. So ultimately, you end up with, uh, with a set of goals and a set of technologies. Uh, we had SOA first, uh, and we had cloud and big data, and I'm gonna talk a bit about these uh, as, we, as we move forward. Um, they have a distinct relationship, but first I'm gonna talk about what is complexity. So if you noticed at the beginning of the talk, uh, the talk is about complex systems and, and data gravity. Um, complex systems uh, are a very interesting topic. What I've chosen to do is to try and simplify the definition of a couple of what I would consider fairly complex topics. Uh, the first is around complexity. Uh, I'm using them as measures. So if you look at the definition, uh, is a measure of an intricate arrangement of interacting components. So think of complexity as being the interaction of all of those components in the background. Uh, that is complexity. Each of the individual components may or may not be complex in and of itself, but their interaction is definitely complex and it can be measured. Now, the accuracy of the measure is something that, uh, that can be debated, um, but it's still complex nonetheless. The other side of the coin is entropy. Um, so those with physics degrees and such, uh, and if you've uh, taken thermodynamic uh, courses or something like that, you may have one idea of what entropy is. Uh, there's another side of entropy, which is around information theory. Um, and I've moved uh, much further to the side of information theory-based entropy. Um, although I am glad to have a debate uh, after if someone would like around uh, why I've defined entropy this way. It is a measure of uncertainty. Uh, you can think of it as, uh, as a way of dealing with uncertainty and measuring how uncertain or what the probability of something is. Uh, so uh, measuring uncertainty is directly related to probability. So with these two definitions, uh, we're going to begin to kind of uh, outline what the effects in, in systems are. This is, uh, this is an amazing picture that I found. You can see the credit uh, down there towards the bottom right. Uh, I was doing my research, um, I've been doing research over the past year trying to, trying to solve for what are the real hidden things around data gravity, why does it exist, um, how does it relate to, uh, to all of these systems. And I came across this, and it's slightly cut off at the top, but if you look, it says entropy increases, complexity first increases, and then decreases. And if you look at these three glasses, it's really the same liquid. You can see the clear distinction on the left where we have the, the split between the two. It's very easy to see what the difference is. That's low entropy and low complexity. It's not very complex. The entropy's low, so there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of uncertainty, um, and there's not a lot of intricacy between the arrangement there. If you look at the medium entropy and high complexity, it is a highly complex thing. Uh, the entropy is medium because it's not completely mixed. You can distinguish the difference um, in at least all the way towards the top and all the way towards the bottom. Uh, but it's still nonetheless a highly complex thing. And then if you look to the far right, you see that it's high entropy. Um, so there's lots and lots of uncertainty on where each of the little bits and things inside it is going to exist. But overall, it's not that complex. If you're thinking uh, about the, uh, the overall uniformity of the system, yes, it's fairly uniform. Uh, but it's not all that complicated of a thing when you look at it in this way. So most systems management tools are designed for this scenario. 
they're designed for low entropy and low complexity. And uh, sadly, uh, the reality is that most systems look like this. In IT today, in a traditional IT data center, this is what you would see, something that's the equivalent of this. Uh, there's some simplified systems, there's some complex systems, there are all of these crazy relationships and uh, reliances, dependencies, and linkages. Um, and sadly, the tools that are being used are, are like this, for this scenario. That doesn't work out so well, which is one of the reasons why we're really struggling um, and why we haven't seen uh, very many enterprises able to leap and cope. But if you think about what Google and Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, if you look at all of these, they assume their systems work like this. They build their systems and they manage their systems in this way. This gives them uh, an advantage and it's why they're able to scale and operate the, operate the way they do. Uh, sadly, enterprises are, are still back in this state. Um, if they managed and operated in this way, they would be much, much better off. These are simple to manage. Um, so if you think about it, uh, if you just visually look at them, throw out thinking of complexity or entropy for a minute and just look. Uh, those two are fairly simple to understand. They're fairly uniform. Not so much. This one is not uniform in any way, and that's, that's the heart of the problem. Uh, so, how do you get to a point where you do have the ability, <clears throat> you do have the ability to actually uh, either move this to the left or to the right? Uh, if you think about it, it would be massively easier to move it to the right. Uh, you could shake it up thoroughly, right? And hopefully you would get something much more like the, uh, like the right-hand side. This has a high level of complexity uh, in several odd ways. And uh, if you think of it as emerging states uh, or spontaneity, uh, it's a good way of understanding how that came about, how that, how that mid section ended up uh, occurring to begin with. Uh, someone had a need in IT, they needed a system, it didn't fit all of the other systems, but they absolutely needed it right now, they had to make it happen. Uh, so what did they do? They did what was necessary to deliver what the business needed. Sadly, uh, that system can't go away now. So now you're stuck with this system that isn't, uh, isn't conformant to everything else. And so more and more of those exceptions occur and you end up in that state. Um, if, however, you moved to, uh, to the right, you would end up with something that could deal with that in a much better way. And for the most part, if you assume that all of the systems um, were the exceptions and that you didn't, uh, you didn't make assumptions, uh, but you were prepared to deal with everything as an exception, then nothing would be an exception. That's the irony or the paradox that's involved here with dealing with, uh, with complex systems, at least in this way. So back to our SOA and, uh, and cloud story, uh, along with big data, all of these things uh, end up having an interrelation, and I'll explain that a little bit more. But if we first just take uh, SOA, or service-oriented architecture, which has been around for quite a while, and in some, in some worlds it's a dirty, uh, dirty word, but the reality is uh, everyone's at least attempting to do this, or this is being done by the majority of people in one place or another. Um, you're not trying to build one of these. Uh, this is a mousetrap game. Um, you can see it's fairly complicated. It's, it's, uh, it's fun, but at the same time, uh, you wouldn't want to operate something like this. Uh, if you don't think this happens in real life uh, in IT, uh, I've got news. Uh, this is built in real life. This is actually a real life mousetrap game. Um, People do do this, and I actually came across this and was surprised that someone had actually built Mousetrap. It looks like an awful lot of work uh, for a Rube Goldberg machine. So you end up with, with a mess. And the way to get out of that mess is to standardize and simplify. Uh, so one way to do that, uh, if you think about just services for a minute, um, if you think in a PaaS stack, if you're building a service, 
Uh, ideally, you'd have an OS with a runtime, a framework, some logic, and an interface. If you repeat this pattern over and over again, you end up with something that's, uh, that's generally idempotent, it's asynchronous, it's restful, it scales out, um, it's redundant. It's redundant because uh, you not only can make copies of a single service in and of itself again and again, uh, but you can also make many versions of this and you're simply changing the logic and potentially what interface you're exposing. But the underlying components are all the same, so it becomes much, much easier to manage. You're simplifying, you're reducing, you're, you're reducing the underlying complexity of if every single thing, if, if you think about it, think about if you had 25 different operating systems and all of them had different runtimes for different languages and they used different frameworks, um, the complexity and cost of managing and maintaining that just gets higher and higher and higher. Uh, so this is generally what's in a large enterprise IT uh, data center today. It's not what's in a Netflix or an Amazon or uh, one of the very large cloud providers, but it's definitely in legacy IT. One of the benefits uh, is that you can then make lots and lots of copies of this and it's very easy for someone to wrap their head around. And by the way, if you find a bug or a problem, it's very easy to know which things are affected by it. And if you want to remediate it, it's incredibly easy as well because you know where you need to apply the fix. You either need to apply it to all of the copies of this service or none of the copies uh, versus uh, trying to go hunt down which thing has what dependency on which component. This is, uh, this is really key in simplifying uh, and being able to, to manage. So this enables composable systems. Uh, so uh, a shout out to James Yurkert who first mentioned uh, composable systems to me uh, quite a while back. So if you think about taking each of, these, uh, each of these services and being able to leverage them as Legos, interchangeable things that you can just build something that's more complex, uh, more, uh, more robust, but it's built of these interchangeable components. Uh, you can build something very, very powerful, but the components themselves are simplistic. This is the way to get management, scalability, and all of the things that, that we all want out of systems. And I'm going backwards, okay. So, um, the next thing we move to is, is cloud. So if you think about what I was describing with, with SOA, um, those are things that are used in clouds today. So SOA effectively is fitting inside of, of some of the things that we want to do uh, with cloud and things as a service. So this is a fairly complex uh, picture. Um, you can see there, there are a lot of dependencies and, uh, and interactions between these services, the applications, and the data. So you're trying to architect, build, scale, manage, maintain, support, uh, resolve issues uh, in these different collections of dependencies or these, uh, or these complex systems. It gets interesting when you try and deal with the granularity of systems and, and their dependencies. So uh, you might be able to see the overall big picture, but things get interesting when a new dependency appears. If all of these things were different, it would be virtually impossible to, uh, to cope. Uh, even in cloud today, we see services built on top of services built on top of services. Uh, if you think about someone running on top of, uh, of Amazon and then someone else running uh, a service that's leveraging a service, if you think about uh, something like Dropbox, you might have an application that leverages Dropbox and, uh, and also has authentication against, say, Facebook. Uh, these are dependencies and linkages that you've set up inside of your application that, that you now have to cope with and you're dependent on those other services. But each of those services is really made up of a complex set of services beneath it. So you end up with services stacked on top of services stacked on top of services. This is the way things really are right now. Um, we've just been able to abstract them with, uh, with interfaces. So uh, cloud is really uh, a standardization of a lot of things that we've done in SOA, but uh, its elasticity and the availability to muster resources has, has given us uh, much more capabilities than if we just had static services or SOA inside of an enterprise. 
uh, that availability is really one of the big benefits. Um, on the big data side, uh, we have this big chunk of, of data with <coughs> services and applications. You can think of that as more of like a RDBMS, uh, right? And they simply got bigger and bigger and bigger. So it got bigger, uh, the data got larger, you get more use of the system, more people want to tie to it. Uh, you could think of something like uh, even S3 or something like that where we're storing lots and lots of things, more people want to use it, it grows, more services, more applications, want access to the new data faster. Uh, and it gets even larger. And at some point, you can't store that inside of a single system. It can be a single logical system, but not, uh, uh, not a single computer, um, unless you consider something that's distributed, uh, highly distributed across networks, a single computer. So what we did with big data, because we couldn't store all of this in a single place, is we decided to break it up. So we broke it up, uh, we effectively broke up the data into little bitty pieces and we attached a, a service or an API and we could do work on this. Uh, this, this effect uh, was revolutionary. We could end up with, uh, with an application that could send a request to all of these data components um, and then ultimately uh, could collect the data uh, back, combine it, and we end up with, uh, with our result. This is uh, very distributed. It's also fairly complex. Uh, this was difficult uh, when things like Hadoop originally came out. Uh, being able to orchestrate something like this and ensure that you end up with, uh, with the response that you, were desi that you desired by collecting all of this back uh, in a scatter-gather pattern uh, it was difficult. Also, um, managing the deployment of all of those nodes, uh, even today, is, is not an easy task. Um, this, is, this is all part of the learning process, uh, especially that enterprises are going through and trying to deploy, manage, and, and deal with something like Hadoop. The problem is uh, you have to manage this in a way that it's simplified, again, that you're trying to treat it as idempotent and such uh, versus uh, trying to just deploy and clone a system. Uh, the idea of... Uh, of doing that just doesn't work in, in this type of world, especially where the data on these uh, shards, if you think of them that way, or, uh, or Hadoop nodes, or what have you, uh, is gonna be different. It can also be a matter of, uh, of what you wanna trade off uh, between do you move the data over the network to the app, or do you move the app to the data, which is really one of the hearts of, of data gravity uh, in how you advantage yourself today it's what's easier. If you have a very small, finite amount of data uh, and you need to do lots of processing with it, it may be easier to shuffle the data to, uh, to where the processing is. At the same time, if you have mountains and mountains of data, you may be vastly benefited by moving the app uh, to the data. This, uh, this effect is kind of the, the mixture of, of what has been done in big data. It's also something that... Uh, uh, that a lot of different uh, problems have, have, been, uh, have been emerging. If you think about trying to collect all the data from uh, the super collider or something like that, uh, they've had a struggle with what do you do with that. And after you've collected the data, um, do you try and shuffle uh, petabytes of data over a network? Is that more advantageous? Or is it more advantageous to build something uh, nearer and literally uh, uh, allow people to run uh, operations against the data set where it is in place. Uh, these types of things uh, are decisions that are bound by data gravity and, and really bound by the speed of light uh, on networks. You can only transmit so much data so fast, no matter how high an end of a network you have. Uh, so you're still limited by that. So if you think about it, these things are all related. Um, which is really the point. All of these things are related. They're all governed by the rules of complexity. They're all governed by entropy and data gravity. All of these things are, uh, uh, still fall under that same rule set. And they're all subject to the same weaknesses. They're all subject to being able to be advantaged or disadvantaged by, uh, by data gravity as well. So if you think about it, uh, optimizing for data gravity, so optimizing where you're more advantaged. Do you move the data to the app? Do you move the app or the logic uh, closer to the data? Um, 
do you manage the higher entropy um, and lower the complexity? I think you do. I think you manage the higher entropy by lowering the complexity of the individual components and you drive towards a composable system. It becomes easier to, uh, to maintain, easier to manage, easier to build on. Uh, this is one of the things that PAS drives, in my opinion, is this behavior. Uh, it doesn't necessarily optimize for data gravity. That's something that you have to architect um, into the system, but uh, it is something nonetheless that, uh, that if you're trying to do things in a smart way, you're going to optimize for. You're trying to deal with, uh, with high entropy, uh, with spontaneity, so you're still gonna have failures, you're still gonna have systems that, uh, that come up, but if your system's designed to manage uh, as everything is an exception, then nothing is an exception. So, uh, this is really the ideal way that you would want to, uh, that you would want to address uh, how you manage and deal with, uh, with IT today and, and in the future. So uh, just a, a brief repeat, uh, a little bit more detail. I wanted this in the slides. Again, you're optimizing uh, for data gravity. You manage to higher entropy, which is uncertainty, as a reminder, uh, by lowering complexity and using composable systems. And that's it. Thank you.